Today, uh, we have really the honor to have Lily Biggins speak to us. Um, on top of that, Mayor Price wouldn't be here, but we have uh, Mayor Pro, uh, Pro Term um, Mr. Zimmerman, or Mayor Pro Term Zimmerman, Sim Zimmerman. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, we just want to let you know everything that's going on with Steer for Worth, LYP, things of that nature. I always, when I get up here and speak, I always just want to make sure that all of you have an opportunity to get involved more with these organizations. They're, they're doing outstanding stuff in the city. If, you do, if you're not currently involved with either Steer for Worth or LYP, we definitely want to, want to make sure that you ask the questions, get involved. This is, for, if this is your first time here, this is really what the mayor, Steer for Worth, created specifically for young professionals, really you, uh, for you to make an impact in, in the city. So definitely take advantage of that. It's an awesome, awesome program. I've been involved with the education task force. There's a lot of task forces out there to do. LYP, the same thing. Um, we're doing a lot of really cool things in the community. So if you're here and you're just kind of checking it out, you heard somebody got an invite, great food, you're going to come here, Miss Big and Speak. Definitely, uh, that's awesome. But we definitely want you to, uh, if you have questions in regards to the actual organizations, please, please ask. Uh, well, I won't take much of that any longer now. I'll introduce Mr. Um, or Mayor Pro Temp Zimmerman. Uh, he'll actually <laughs> do the inter inter introduction from Ms. Bacon. So, Mr. Mayor Pro Temp Zimmerman. <laughs> as long as he didn't say Mrs., I guess I'm okay. <laughs> Well, welcome. Uh, thanks for attending today's uh, Young Leaders Luncheon. You know, I look out at the room. This is the second time today I've been able to look out across a room filled with young people. Uh, this morning it was a prayer breakfast at uh, Southwest Christian School. People were a little bit younger than you, but uh, the mayor, when she came up with this idea, we talked after she had gone through the election. And one of the demographic demographics that we noticed was missing was you. The young people were not voting, they were not participating in the city activities, and so the mayor, to her credit, said, I'm going to do something about that. And that's how Steer Fort Worth came to be. And it's been amazing to watch all of you grow and learn more about your city government and how you have a very important part in it. Uh, special thanks to uh, Joseph DeLeon and, uh, and everybody for hosting this. And thanks to... Uh, and thanks to the mayor's staff for uh, putting this all together. The mayor's staff is principally uh, the, the real machinery behind uh, this outside of you. Uh, as I've said, this allows you to serve your community and get engaged in Fort Worth. And that's vital. Just to show you how bad the situation is, you probably know this, but somewhere on a good day, 10%, and on a bad day, 5% of the eligible voters vote in any given election. Now, what does that tell you? Well, first of all, it tells you that 5% of the citizens are deciding what the other 95% are going to do. And that scares me a little bit. Now, there are all sorts of committees that are put together, and, uh, and if you haven't gotten on one, Keeman is the man to go talk to. Keeman, raise your hand so I'm sure everybody knows you. But <clears throat> and, and the programs that have been put together have been really, really great. Uh, you've heard from Matt Rose. And we understand that uh, next month you're going to hear from George P. Bush, another Bush coming down the road. <laughs> Today we're here uh, to talk about health care, which is one of the new, uh, new task force. There's arts and culture, health and wellness, and homelessness. There are two, three of the uh, new uh, programs that we put in place for you to, uh, to go work on. Uh, one of the things that people look at when they start to move to a city is the quality of life. And one of the most important parts of quality of life is to make sure that you've got good security, good police forces, and good health care. And certainly, here in Fort Worth, we have that. So 
as you sit here today, you're going to really get entertained by our featured speaker. But to get to that, I've got to introduce Joseph DeLeon, who is having trouble holding a job right now. He's the, currently the VP of Business Development and Ambulatory Services, and in about two weeks, he will become president of Texas Health Harris Methodist Hospital, Southwest Fort Worth. I'm really, really pleased that he's taken that. I'd be more pleased if he was going to stay in my district, but in redistricting, uh, I got everything across the street from him. So, uh, but I've told him that between Jungus and I, we'll come haunt him as much as we can. Well, anyhow, with no further ado, Joseph, you got the stage. It's always nice to shake hands with another uh, ring that looks similar to, to mine. <laughs> well, good morning to, to all of you. Thanks, uh, thanks again for coming here. I, tough weather. We ordered up. We made a mistake when we ordered the weather. We checked the wrong box. But it's my privilege just to welcome you again and to, and to, and to introduce to you my uh, boss and also my friend. All of you, I know, as you go through your careers, are looking for what's the perfect boss. And the perfect boss is, is going to be somebody <clears throat> that I've been uh, fortunate to have and I, and, and I get to introduce to you. She is uh, a woman who has uh, many years of experience, who has a great perspective, but most of all has a heart that is looking that, that, that seeks every day to serve the community. She is all about her community. As you hear a little bit about her background, you'll see that it's not just talk. It's, it's what she does every day. Even this morning, as she spent time over at the Texas Workforce Commission, <clears throat> as she spends days and hours uh, serving on the DFW Airport Board of Directors, uh, now is serving as, in her second term as the chairman of that board. Uh, as she has been honored by numerous organizations, including the uh, Renaissance Cultural Center. In 2004, she was given the Living Legend Award. Uh, she's honored by the YWCA's Tribute to Women in Business. I've got a list that goes a whole page. I'm only going to give you about four or five of those. Safe Haven Legacy of Women Award in 2012. Uh, the President's Volunteer, this is the President of the United States, Volunteer Call to Service Award, which is the nation's highest honor for volunteer service. And you don't get there for serving 100 hours a year. You get there for serving thousands and thousands of hours over the years. But Lily Biggins <clears throat> is, a, is an RN. Uh, she became an RN uh, at the JPS Nursing School a few years ago. I'm not going to tell them how many. <laughs> but then she received her bachelor's in nursing from UTA and her master's uh, degree in nursing from Texas Women's University. She also is an adjunct uh, professor, has been at UT Southwestern and also at UTA over the years as well. Uh, Lily has many, many years uh, experience as a chief nursing officer, as a nurse taking care of patients at the bedside, uh, and has been president of this hospital uh, for almost a year now, <clears throat> after serving here as a vice president of operations for about 12 years. So Lily has served the Metroplex from Parkland Hospital to JPS to Plaza Hospital here uh, in town, and also as part of Texas Health Resources and Texas Health Harris Methodist Fort Worth for uh, almost 14 years now, maybe 15 years now. <clears throat> but so, without further ado, I could go on forever, like I said, telling you about Miss Biggins, but she is a woman, a, a leader who leads with heart, and that's what is a privilege to all of us here at this, this hospital. So, turn it over to Lily. <laughs> and I didn't even know. I saw him come in and I said, oh, hi. That's how hard I'm running this morning. I had no idea he was going to be the one to, to, um, to announce that I was going to be doing this. He's just an awesome guy, and I am thrilled that he will be um, the president. Well, he already is. You know, when you get the announcement, it says it has a date attached to it, but you actually go to work long before you <laughs> actually get that date, as most of you know. Uh, so just an awesome um, upcoming young leader who is going to take this world by storm. And it is my privilege to have been a part of his life and his world for the time that he's been here, which has now been eight, almost nine years. And he's always um, 
been uh, here for the patients and for the community, so I won't embarrass him by going on and on as he's done me, but I just want you to know that we have another uh, great leader who's going to lead a great organization for Texas Health Resources. So uh, first off, I just want to thank you for um, inviting me to speak today. I uh, thank um, Mayor Pro Tem Zim, which is what we call him, so if you need some way out, where'd he go? If you need some way out, just refer to him as that. He loves it. He's, uh, <laughs> he loves it because that's who he is. He's just a very personable, great leader in the city of Fort Worth. And, you know, great leaders don't have a lot of airs about them because that's uh, great leaders are touching the people and that they have realized that they work for us. It's much like my role here as president of this hospital. I tell staff all the time, I work for you. You don't work for me. You hear people talking about, you work for me, you got the wrong leader. Just remember that as you, as you get into your roles. And uh, Mr. Zimmerman certainly knows that. Um, as I look around the room, I, am, I want you to know that I am very encouraged uh, to see so many of you here uh, because you are the future of the organization and uh, future of this great community we call Fort Worth. And as a native Fort Worthian, I want you to know how proud I am that you're taking part in this great organization and allowing yourself to grow and to learn and to uh, be ready to take over uh, from us because we don't want to do this all the time. Uh, we want to go home and pat the dog, you know, or as I tell staff, watch the squirrels go up and down the trees. So it's very encouraging to see you here, and I'm sure the weather kept a few people away, but um, they, um, they will be able to see this, I'm told, on uh, CCTV if uh, my information is, um, is accurate. So um, again, good morning to all of you. You know, I was asked just a little while ago, uh, I guess maybe a few weeks ago, to uh, appoint someone to serve in the capacity of uh, giving some dietetic uh, kind of input for the group, uh, one of the core group, one of the task forces, I guess, of this big group. And so we, um, we gave uh, Joseph, I believe it was the um, uh, executive health dietitian is gonna fill that role. And, and the way, the reason I mentioned that is because uh, healthcare business is undergoing a lot of change right now. And one of the things I want to talk about as I start is about how Texas Health as a system uh, continues to be at the forefront of many of these changes. You know, we've been a sick care organization, which means if you're ill, you come to the hospital and we take care of you. And of course, we're the best. And, and it really isn't bragging if you can do it, and we can. So um, we're the best. But we've moved outside of the walls because our mission statement is that we're going to improve the health of the people in the communities we serve. And we, have, we haven't done that improvement as well as we need to. So uh, one of the things we're doing is moving outside the walls of the hospital on the preventive care side, which is where the dietitian and being a part of the task force of this group, and then to do some um, contingent health improvement on the backside, teaching people with chronic disease and lots of comorbidities, how to stay healthy. So one of the keys to meeting the challenges ahead is to shift our focus from caring for people when they're ill to proactively keeping pe people healthy. And I know that's one of the things that this health challenge has taken on as well. We we're trying to implement uh, behaviors and interventional interventions that can improve health and outcomes over the long term and ultimately improve our overall community and the community's well-being. So I'm going to talk to you a few statistics I want to share with you. Companies in DFW areas suffer an estimated $17 billion loss in productivity each year due to employee health problems. Now, Texas Health Resources got that number real quick, and you won't believe what they're doing to us. Well, I mean for us. Um, they're really investing in the, the health of the people who work for them, and there are about 25,000 of us now. But what, they're, what they've understood at the system level is that productivity does, if you lose productivity, you really have a, a very negative impact on your financials. So remember this number, $17 billion loss in productivity each year due to employee health problems. 
personal health behaviors influence 50 to 70 percent, 50 to 70 percent of an individual's health. Yet we spend only 4 percent of our health dollars to impact those behaviors. So those are numbers that you, you know, you need to hold on to. So we realize that we must inspire change in the way people think about their own health. That's the only way we can improve health, as is in our mission statement, of the people in the communities we serve. And we have to bend that cost curve uh, away from its up, upward traje trajectory, because right now it's going up, and we've got to bend that curve and begin to do a better job of improving the health. To do that, uh, we're transforming from a, a hospital system to a health system. And we're going to continue to focus on patient needs, and the hospital will continue to provide that outstanding care that you've uh, become accustomed to. But uh, we're going to do a lot more. Uh, other pieces of the continuum is we're going to, that we will grow is its importance, and it's important is primary care uh, and wellness. And we're embarking upon a lot of uh, initiatives that centered around those two issues, primary care and wellness. Post-acute care services is still another area that we're involved in now. So we're aiming to help people improve their well-being. And remember, well-being isn't just about the physical aspect of what you have. You know, some of us are round, some of us are thin. I mean, we come in all types of packages, right, girls? <laughs> you notice I targeted the women. I mean, I love conversations with women. Um, but it has to do with mind, body, and spirit. It's the whole person. It's your physical health. It's your mental health. It's how you feel about yourself. It's how you feel about those things that God has enabled you to do. And, and I'll just, uh, and let me just talk about that just for a minute. You know, as leaders, you see leaders who are very successful. And you see leaders who are trying to lead and nobody's following. And I will tell you what a mentor told me years ago. If you think you're leading and you turn around and nobody's following you, guess what? You're not a leader. Leaders have a heart and they have purpose. They live on purpose, and they do those things that are important to the gifts that they've been given to be a leader. And, and many of us do different things as we lead, but pretty much so we're inspired to do what we do. And it's the God in us, for the most part, that allows us to do that. And we're true to him and to the gifts that he's given us is when we have that wonderful experience called success, okay? So we're transforming the health system, the healthcare system, to a system of care. And uh, you might wonder how a hospital can impact a person's well-being. About a year ago, we signed a contract with a company called Healthways. Now, I won't tell you we've figured out everything they're going to do with and to us. But they're a national company that have a lot of evidence-based protocols that have been shown throughout the, the country to improve health of various communities. And one of the things that caught my attention is how in small countries, in smaller communities, they've created things like bike paths. You know, we've done that. Hello, tick. Um, but they've, they've also created um, services for diabetes. You know, if you go into a physician's office and you ask the doctor, how many diabetics are in your patient population, they probably can't tell you. But through Healthways and through the physicians that work closely with Texas Health Resource Hospitals, what they'll be able to do is pull up those patients who are diabetic, pull up those patients who are congestive heart failure or any type of disease process, and then they'll be able to create pathways to improve their health. And that's what we're looking for from Healthways. One of the targets we're looking at initially is diabetes. We know our kids have diabetes, right? They're overweight and they're, they become diabetic. And so we're hoping to get some help from Healthways in many areas where we can improve uh, those, those individuals' health as well. We believe people with a higher well-being are healthier, happier, contribute more to the communities. And the community, they contribute a lot to their jobs as well. The Gallup Healthways Well-Being Index is what they use. And what that does is one of the measures that's being used by forward-thinking employers and communities to evaluate their environment, which is the physical environment, as a first step and making improvements to foster better health care and better well-being. Uh, so well-being, as I said earlier, is more than just physical health. So one of the things that uh, we'll be looking at is six areas, which is life evaluation, emotional health, physical health, 
uh, healthy behaviors, uh, work environment, basic access, you know, to food, shelter. You know, in Fort Worth, we've adopted the homeless initiative, and we really take care of our homeless individuals. If they want to be taken care of, we're here for them. So some of those things that we're already known to do in Fort Worth uh, will become even more apparent and more prominent in the way we approach them. By interviewing at least 1,000 U.S. adults every day, every day, this well-being index provides real-time measurements and insights needed to improve health, increase productivity, and uh, to move us to where we'll be able to improve that health. So the goal would be to drop um, the number of hospitalizations. And Joseph doesn't like to hear that number because he and I won't have a job if we drop it too low, right? <laughs> But it will get people out of the hospital and into the right environment. And, uh, you know, with the population growth and all the great work that's been done by many of you in this room and certainly our elected officials, we will continue to be the place that uh, top Fortune 500 companies will bring their, their companies. I mean, they're going to come because we're so good in Fort Worth that they're going to bring their businesses here. So we have to make room so we have additional capacity is basically what it uh, boils down to. So Texas Health and Health Ways are developing what's needed uh, to connect people with their own health and uh, to make sure that they uh, can get whatever they need and whatever they want from that product. Actual measures of well-being in North Texas using that Gallup Health Ways uh, Improvement Index uh, will, will certainly get us there. We're also encouraging North Texas to take advantage of a tool called the Daily Challenge. Okay. Who is that? Doesn't look like her, but that's what we were trying to capture, her on a bike. <laughs> These are the well-being dimensions I talked about. And here's the daily challenge. Uh, and I want you to take, um, take note of this one because we're encouraging North Texans to take advantage of this tool. Every morning you'll get a pop-up and it's a daily challenge. And what they do is they offer you certain things that will improve your health. It's really neat. I've been doing it now for about three months. It's a lot of fun. One morning they said, sit on the floor, raise your knees up to your chest, lay back and rock. And I thought, nah, I'm not going there. <laughs> but, but other things they talk about, you know, things like try and get, you know, different beans and uh, vegetables in you for a day. Try this for a little bit. There's the website. It's uh, texashealth.org backslash wellbeing. And so if you want to participate, it's free. You just log in to that website, uh, register for it, and every morning by 0700 you will get a message. And you earn points for it. So, you know, it says, for example, a challenge one day might ask you to share three things that you're grateful for. And remember I talked about the, the well-being, the, the uh, behavior and, and the well-being uh, sense. So you think about three things that you're grateful for, and then you name a sport or exercise you'd like to learn and take up again is one of the challenges. And so what it does is it says, that's the question, and then it gives you the reason that that's so important to your well-being. So I wanted to share that with you and bring that to you as an offering from Texas Health Resources. Mm -hmm. uh, we're aiming to make it easier for people to add doses of well-being to their daily lives is what we're trying to do. Our mission, as I said, is to make sure that we take care of our community. And for that, uh, to do that, it means that we're going to invest in it. So I talked a little bit about faith a few minutes ago. And I talked about uh, being servant and being served, you know, how we serve and how we actualize ourselves. This emergency care center is what I want to talk to you about right now. I want to talk to you about little faith and big faith, OK? This is big faith. This is big. And, you know, in today's environment, many people aren't going out and spending a lot of money uh, on emergency departments because the general consensus is it brings in a lot of patients and it brings in a lot of non-paying patients. Well, we believe, we believe as a company that no mission, no margin. Not no margin, no mission, which you'll hear both because one says if you don't make the money, you can't fulfill your mission. Our faith says, and we're a faith-based organization, that we have a mission, and as long as we're fulfilling our mission and we're trusting the one who can fulfill it, uh, that we'll be able to be successful. 
So this is evidence. This is big faith. If you think little, you get little. If you think big, you get big. And if your faith is small, guess what you get? So you can tell that we have this enormous faith. And the new emergency care center we're in the process of building is going to be unlike any other. Now, as uh, Zim said earlier, you know, you need to know about what's going on in your community. You need to vote. You need to know what's, what's happening that's going to be a draw and what's important to the 230-something thousand people who moved here from last year to this year. So this is one of them. It's health care. People come to communities for the workforce. They come for health care, schools. Those are the questions they ask. What is it like? And when we go out and get business, the David Bazinos and, you know, the people who work with our um, CBDs, that's what they do. They're out there trying to figure out how to get big businesses in here, Healthcare being one. So the new emergency care, care center, which is you're looking at a rendering now, that we're in the process of building is going to be like, um, wow. It's a culmination of years of soliciting input from our community. It's also a culmination of living in 24,000 square feet of space and having patients all in the hallway for a long time and now being able to uh, get out of that situation. This slide shows a rendering of the outside of the facility. It's a freestanding building and basically the reason it's freestanding is because we didn't have enough space in, our current, uh, in the current footprint of the hospital to add it. So we're going to put it across the street and connect it to the hospital by that sky bridge that you see there. It allows us to keep pace with the growing Fort Worth area population and um, continue to provide the access to quality at a high level of care. We're a trauma center, we're level three neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, the US Census Board, of course, reported that the population in DF DFW grew faster than any other metropolitan area in the country between those years, between 11 and 12. Uh, Texas Health Fort Worth's emergency department is a safety net for many in the community. And so we absolutely have to do this. So I wanted to share this project with you so you'll be able to tell others about it. It's, um, it's going to have beauty. Now, if you've been in our ED, how many of you were born here? Ah, oh, look at that. I tell you, there's never a group where somebody wasn't born. How about your parents? Were they born here? There you go, more hands. So you're invested in this hospital, and we understand that it's a community investment, and so we always realize that we're owned by the community, we work for the community, and uh, we want to make sure that we're meeting the needs. Does no good for people to go and get companies to move here and bring jobs to this area if we're not doing what we're supposed to do in the healthcare arena. <coughs> so the emergency department's main lobby will look like this. This is a rendering. If you've been in our ED, you know that nobody's in our lobby. Our patients go back immediately. But we still want a nice entrance, and so that's what the lobby's going to look like. Our partners in this design is HKS. Now, I give you that plug not because um, of any reason other than there's a lady in the audience that came over a little while ago, a woman. They sent a woman to do the job, right? And uh, she's HKS. She's on crutches. And uh, she came over because they wanted to support this presentation and be here to hear what we were going to say about the new ED center. They're the, the architectural firm. Where is she? There, way at the back with the crutch. She just had knee surgery, and they needed somebody to come in case we had questions. And so they sent her. And I thank you for being here. Uh, so this is uh, an example of the main lobby. And this is the nurse's station, what it's going to look like in the exam room. Isn't that pretty? Really pretty. So a few facts about the facility. We broke ground in May. It's a $57 million project. And we expect completion by the end of this year. Probably the middle of, the middle of December we should get the keys. It will be approximately 75,000 square feet by way of a footprint. Right now, remember, we're in 24,000 square feet. So it triples the space. And we will go from about 63 beds, and that's from annexing everything that gets empty, to 90. You know, when people move out, you kind of say, oh, this is my room. I have a purse room. My kids moved out. <laughs> 
and I put a big purse stand in the room so you can't get in there very easy. So it's like one like you see in the, in the department stores, you know, where it has all these arms sticking out. Don't move, you know, so when somebody move out of a part of this emergency room and all the places that are connected, you know, we've, we've taken over the space. So we've taken over enough space to get to 63 and we'll go to 90. And the good news about this is it'll be beautiful for the patients. You know, right now when we're busy, you'll see patients in the hallway in our emergency department. And we try to tell them, you know, that you can go to another hospital because you need to be admitted. We've called the other hospital, they have a bed. And if you will allow us, we'll arrange a transfer. And most of the time they say, I just drove past there, just leave me where I am. And uh, I think a lot of that's by reputation, and even though you're in a hallway, it doesn't mean you get hallway therapy. We tell them that they're in the express lane <laughs> to get to a bed, and we give them these little eye covers that you get on the airplane, okay? And then we give them the little earplugs, and they just lay there until we can get them upstairs to a room. So um, this will really help us to uh, be able to better take care of patients. And all of, these are, all of these are rooms. Right now we have curtains between it. So you're going to be really proud of this. And hopefully when you see the announcement, you will come and tour it with us when we open. So we're incorporating state-of-the-art uh, simulation labs in this building as well. Uh, and these simulation labs will be education. It's an educational facility for caregivers of all disciplines. I think you may have seen in the newspaper that MadStar, which is our public utility model, just got a huge award as a system. So when they trained their paramedics and their EMTs, and I used to teach in that program, I taught EKG interpretation, but when they train, they will be able to come to this hospital and through these labs be able to simulate uh, how they take care of patients in the field. So I'll show you a little bit more about that. But these labs are gonna be used by nurses and uh, firefighters. Uh, teachers who are in the community and we have several sim labs throughout the community uh, but we don't have enough. The mannequins that we buy will be able to talk, uh, they'll be able to, you'll get EKGs and you'll get O2 sats and gas exchanges, they'll pee and they'll poop, they'll do it all and they're $275,000 a piece so they should do it all. <laughs> But a talking mannequin patient will allow us to be able to really train our paramedics and train our staff, the staff that's here as well, on how to better take care of patients. The scenarios are taped. So if, you know, people who are never wrong, you've lived with some of those people, right? <laughs> They're never wrong. They're always right. Well, they'll be able to look at the videotape and they'll be able to see where they went wrong. So the sessions are videotaped so caregivers can be debriefed afterwards. It's what that said. That's a better way of saying, yeah, we got you. You were wrong, so you got to do it right the next time. This is the back of an ambulance, which is one of the simulation labs. So we're taking the actual back uh, of an ambulance, putting it into the structure. And so you can understand how MedStar, CareFlight, or any of the EMS providers can stand outside like this gentleman is shown here, and this is a nice rendering provided by our architectural firm, but it will look much like this. And so we're standing outside, and then they're doing the stuff they do on the inside of the ambulance as it's going down the street, and, uh, and then people will be able to critique the actual work. So you can actually hook them up to an EKG, can hook them up to the O2 sat and get their sats and all in the back of the ambulance. And the patient can be taken from the ambulance then into the operating room. Because here's our OR simulation lab. You know, one of the things that happen right now is when you get a, an ambulance in, the patients sort of go off into cyberspace. I mean, the paramedic brings them in, get them here safety, safely, that's their job. And then they go into the care of the hospital. And so there's no continuity there. Well, with this simulation lab, we could take that same patient, that same mannequin, into the operating room, because here's the operating room simulation lab. And it will allow the EMS providers, doctors and nurses to run scenarios uh, that's all education in, in nature. Then there's the trauma simulation lab. We get a lot of trauma. We're a level two trauma center. 
we support our level one trauma center, which is JPS, in this community, and uh, we get a lot of trauma. So how do we train people to be good trauma providers? Well, right now, people are just in the way. They're in the way. You get a level one trauma, 10 people are standing at the door when you come in. So this will allow us to do some of these scenarios up in a simulation lab and keep people out of the way while at the same time training them. So I wanted to share those labs with you. This is the ICU. Once they finish the OR procedure, they go up to the intensive care unit. And so we'll have one of those labs too that looks exactly like the ICU that's in Bloxham Tower. The OR looks exactly like the operating rooms that are in our OR. And the, the resuscitation bay looks exactly the same. So you can see if the equipment's here, if the boom's there, you know exactly how, how to work that room. So you can see that we've got big plans uh, for the community. And uh, in the, IC, in the uh, ED, we're building in some space in between the two trauma resuscitation bays so students can stand in between the two rooms in an encased space, not in the way, and watch the resuscitation from those spaces. And this is the heart of what, I, what I'm enjoying about this project. I love having more space. I love having the academic piece. Uh, but the geriatric clinic is what I'm really wanting to make sure you know about as you leave here today. You know, we have um, lots and lots of elderly coming down the pike, right? And uh, the problem with that is that we have lots of physicians who no longer want to take care of Medicare patients because of the reimbursement. Lots of people. And so it takes a long time to get into a physician's office if you're an elderly person. Who's, who's taking care of an elderly parent now? There you go. Hands. There you go. <laughs> My husband. Yeah. <laughs> Don't tell him I said that, J.D. Um, so, so we know that it creates issues with getting into the doctor's office. I am personally responsible right now for my sister's care. And my sister is the older, and she really used to spank my honey a lot. <laughs> and uh, you know, was responsible to help raise us, if you will, while my mom and dad work. Now, we all grew up in something quasi to that. The elderly always took care of the family, you know, the older child, especially if you're a girl. So now she's beginning to become a little demented. She's got some heart problems and all. And I will tell you, I just had a fight with her primary care doctor just the other day uh, because he wants to have her come in on the 20, no, on the 19th. And she needed to have been in last week. And this happens all the time. So this clinic is gonna focus on the elderly population. We'll see patients requiring follow-up care after an emergency room visit. And hopefully create a transition for those who either don't have a primary care physician or who need to be seen in a non-emergent environment uh, while they're waiting to get to their regular primary care doctor. Our goal is to make care, this care experience easier for the elderly population and also for the family member who takes care of that elderly person. The clinic addresses two issues, the growing number of elderly emergency uh, patients and the fact that fewer primary care physicians are taking care of these patients. So this is really one of the things that I am really excited about. And it's going to have a lot of glitz, glamour, and magic. We don't do anything halfway here. And so we're putting in glass tile and I mean all the whistles and bells. But this is a rendering of what it's going to look like. The colors are warm. They'll be your uh, gold and browns and all and you know the clinic will be staffed by a geriatrician which is somebody who takes care of older people and hopefully we'll avoid the labeling of people as Alzheimer's patients when they're simply age-appropriate demented and so we we are really hopeful to get a lot of really good work out of this clinic we'll have a lab there we'll have x-ray uh, capability there and we hope to see patients who have disease processes like COPD chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, diabetes, heart failure. And this is an example of how we're shifting the focus from being in the emergency room and in the hospital to doing some preventive training and then some post-acute care. In the back of this uh, second floor where this clinic is and these simulation labs, there are huge classrooms being built. And we're gonna do Zuma classes for the elderly, yeah. <laughs> and some Pilates and those kinds of things. 
but mainly we'll have dietitians there, we'll have people there who can help them with articulating the healthcare system. So I'm really excited about this one. And as I've said to members of our team, I'm trying to get this thing perfected so by the time I get there, it'll be ready. <laughs> so, as you can see, you know, we're aiming high. We're using our faith to do things that we know make a difference to people in this community. And I hope that you'll come and see some of this uh, when we finish with it uh, mid-December. Now what I'd like to do, if I could, is just stop for a minute here and uh, take any questions you might have. Yes. Right now, we see a lot of employers that look at health and wellness programs in-house as sort of a luxury. How can we, as young leaders, convince uh, corporations and organizations around town to invest more in their largest um, investment, their human capital? Yeah, I, and I agree with that. Pull your data would be where I'd start. It's just pull the data and look at the things we talked about. Look at your productivity. Look at the days absent. Um, you know, one of the things that we did is we looked at how do we keep our employees well? How do we keep them well? So if you do the data, do the data dive and see what's in there, and then look on the other side and say, well, how many of those people have diabetes? How many of them are hypertensive, which is a big population? 120 pound people run around with 140 over 80. 150 over 60. I mean, they have these big high numbers, the systolic numbers. So I would pull the data, just ask for the data, and then uh, look for something small. I'll tell you how we did it out at the airport because we had really not invested in that. There was a big vacant building out there, and we began to look at how healthy are the employees. And so they took that big, uh, through the board, took that big open building, and put a fitness center in it. And then from there went to, okay, let's get a couple of nurse practitioners to look at doing some assessments. So you may not be able to go all the way fast, but if you take little incremental steps, and we'll bring the mobile unit and help you with pulling some of that data if you want to. We have a Wellness for Life mobile unit. In fact, we will soon have three, do you have three? Four, we'll soon have four. And what we do is we go into the Lockheed Martins and those other companies, and we do mammograms, and we do all kinds of things. We do uh, PSA prostate screenings, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, all of that stuff out in the field. And then we give that data to the companies so they know what they're dealing with. So you might invite us in, too. But I just think if you start with the data and, uh, it, and ask people if you could do profiles, we fill out a profile every year. And what it does for THR is it asks us, what were your most recent numbers? And then they reward and incent us to go to the doctor. They reward and incent the females to go and get their mammograms. It's $25, but you know, we all like money. <laughs> and you know, it's a commitment that they have made to us. So the real reason we go and do it is because if somebody cares enough about me to try and pay me to go and get a mammogram, why wouldn't I go do it? Because what's important to, to the company has to be that human capital. Does that help? Yes. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. In addition to the website that you showed us that we can go and register for, what would you say are some additional simple steps that we can take as young professionals to promote health and wellness in the community? Hmm. Hopefully your task force is gonna come up with something. <laughs> I think Betsy's done a pretty good job of this, um, the bike trails and all. I mean, there's so many things, and, and I don't know if you know, but we're going to do some bikes throughout the community, and we'll have a docking station right here on campus. Uh, I think that's set to roll out on the 22nd or so, some of you city folks. It's 22nd, isn't it? You know, um, everybody's just into it. It's just the new buzz thing. Do you have, a, you, you have any ideas about that, J.D.? Uh. Liz, what are some of the things that you guys are doing? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was my answer, too. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing? With our task force? Mm -hmm. Some of the ideas are coming. They're rising to the top. Yeah. Go ahead. 
Well, we, we've kind of narrowed down our topic somewhat. <laughs> Well, um, so our task force just recently met, and, and what we determined was, um, as in, in terms of what we can do in the time frame that we have, uh, I think probably one of the things that impacts all of our community is we all go out to eat. And we've seen models in other communities, um, and actually the point system that you talked about is something that we're going to have to talk about because it's a great idea, mm -hmm. but ways to, to encourage restaurants to offer healthy options and even to uh, come up with a grading system that they can be certified as um, a healthy restaurant. And again, this, this is just a starting point. So That's it's good. Great, it's a great way to start, but um, the art task force is, is just in the initial phases of that and uh, working with our the restaurant association in order to promote that. And again, um, you know, throughout the whole community, we think it'll be at least beneficial to promote and uh, the awareness of healthy options. Um, if, if nothing else is a starting point, just at the restaurants we all eat at. So. That's great. That's a great idea. And then if you'll take this assessment, and if you can just roll that out, it really, it's a good, it's a good educational tool. It tells you why you eat certain foods and why you should, and how it works in your body. Yes? Do you find that most, uh, when we talk about health and everything else, it always seems to come down to dietary, mm -hmm. what we eat, and how we work out, all that kind of stuff. Do you find, and this is just a question I don't know, do you guys run studies in regards to specific people groups that obviously <coughs> Mexican food is very high in mm -hmm. and sodium and all the bad stuff that you're not supposed to eat? But it's just a way of, it's a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. So how do you address some of that? Or, and I'm just bringing up a question. Do you guys have data that they guys find, yeah, this is, I mean, we know in the Hispanic community diabetes is huge because of the diet and everything else. But what are some of the things if anything, educate. I mean, I just find that as being such a. Because I love my Mexican food. <laughs> well, let me tell you. Uh huh. Yep. We all do. It's a lot more health conscious, and I love that food as well. But uh, <laughs> I definitely enjoy going to my mom. So, so do you, have you ever thought about that, anything like that? Or, or I mean, I see that as a huge obstacle, and I really wonder what are some of the things that we can do to address that, if anything. Well, of course, you know, we have our foods as well. Of course. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And my, and my kids come to my house for that. <laughs> then they go home and eat their lettuce. <laughs> but, um, you, know, I, you know, it's a part of our culture. And I think we can eat anything we want to. I really believe that. You just have to cut back on what you eat. You know, don't give up the things that are important to you as an individual. Why would you? I mean, that's what makes Fort Worth such a unique place. We're so diverse, you know, and we have so much to celebrate. You know, when people come to your house, you think they want you to give them a salad. They come to your house to eat with you because they know your mom's going to make something that's really traditional. When they come to my house, they know what I'm cooking. So I think what it, I think the, the key there for your, your group and mine is that we just do, you know, we eat in moderation. Other than that, you know, pig out every now and then, and it's just a part of who we are. And, you know, I think it's interesting because our genes, and I'm not an expert on genomics or anything, but I think that I have watched my brothers eat like pigs. I mean, just eat all day long, and they never gain weight. So I think it's something about our bodies. So it's not all about what we put in. It's about the way we use it as well. So just keep eating. And I mean, just eat moderation. <laughs> you talked a little bit about your mission. <laughs> you talked a little bit about your mission. And um, so one of the things that, as young leaders, we certainly like to be involved in what's happening in our community. So mm -hmm. what are some things that we can do to assist you in your mission here at Boulder? I think messaging is really important. You know, I think the community has to care about the community. You know, what's important to, to certain groups of people has to be important to us. And, and a couple of things come to mind. One is our young people who are struggling to find jobs. That's why I serve on workforce, is because I want to be that constant voice there that says, just because a kid got in trouble three years ago, don't throw them away. You know, they've got 30, 40 years to live. Uh, so helping with job creation for the youth and programs and, and in the programs that exist, making an impact that says when they come and approach you, 
I care about you and I'm here to help. I may can't find you a job, but let me tell you, I can be the biggest encourager you have. And the other thing is um, just trying to make sure that, that we can promote safe choices with, with drugs and those kinds of things. You know, and that, that goes to our homeless people. You know, everybody has a lot of empathy for the homeless. We pass down Lancaster across from the T, and my heart just bleeds. So, because so many of those people are young people. But you have to remember, and I tell myself this every time my heart bleeds for them, you have to remember that some people are homeless by choice, okay? But the ones who aren't homeless by choice, I think you have to support what our elected officials are doing to uh, deal with that, especially with our uh, military people. Those things really make a difference. And then we have a huge population of undocumented people in this community. Now, at Texas Health Fort Worth and throughout our system, we do a lot of care. So whatever the, the outcome of the immigration bill comes out, we have to help to onboard people and make them feel welcome so they go through the process and become uh, legal, if that's a, a term that we need to use. You know, you, you think about some of the undocumented people, they came here as babies. This is home. This is home. And so now we, we have this thing that they can't get health care, they can't get uh, food stamps, they can't get, they can't get, they can't get. But look at the population that's growing the most. So I think just really just caring about those kinds of things will help us. And as young leaders, you're going to be the ones, when you cast that vote that Zim talked to you about, you're going to be the ones who will help to make some of those decisions. I think we have to have an immigration bill that says this is the basis on which this country was built. So come and, and let's, let's get you set up so you can be entitled to whatever's here. We do a lot of surgeries, you know, nobody will do the surgery. We say bring us the surgery, we'll do it. And we have physicians who do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, are we there? All right, thank you for having me. Well, thank you, Ms. Vickens. I, I was so excited when we got you to agree to speak. Um, and Mayor, when we sat down to think about the, the roster for this year, she said, you've got to have Lily. <laughs> so um, this is an appreciation from LYP and Stir Fort Worth for thank you. speaking with us. Thank and you Thank much. you so much for having us. Can we uh, get another round of applause for her? And <laughs>